Robert Sapolsky was my professor when we were students at Stanford University many moons ago, and Robert made a huge influence on my, my wanting to be a scientist. He was simply the most influential and outstanding, compelling professor at Stanford because of the way he connected with his students and because of his incredible gift at lecturing, which you're all about to witness. And as you might imagine, Robert has quite a number of impressive accomplishments in his career, including the MacArthur Genius Fellow, loads of highly influential scientific articles and research awards, but perhaps one of his greatest accomplishments are the books that have been so incredibly popular and so impactful to so many people that he's written. Uh, my personal favorites are The Trouble with Testosterone, A Primate's Memoir, and Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, which is the topic of today's lecture. And so let's please all join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Sapolsky to the stage. Well, let me start off by saying actually these lights only give me a dim impression that there's a lot of primates out there, so <laughs> I'm not entirely sure of what I'm seeing here. But let me start off by thanking Justin and Peter. It is a delight to be here and a delight to see one's ex-students flourishing and all that sort of stuff amid in making me feel very elderly. Okay, so. Let me start off. I just got here a couple of hours ago, so I pretty much don't know anyone here. So I feel empowered to ask all sorts of invasive personal questions of you guys. OK, how many of you here have a family history of heart disease? Cancer, high blood pressure, ulcers, stroke. Wow, there's a hand there that's not even going down between the questions. <laughs> Okay, that is not good. How many of you have a family history of somebody with a really bad case of leprosy? <laughs> no hands. How about that cousin you're stuck sitting next to with Thanksgiving, the one going to the bathroom every 10 minutes because of the dysentery? Not that either. How about that extra special relative who is just teeming with liver parasites the size of your fists? Not much there either. And all things considered, this is not very surprising. Very few of us in this room seriously worry about smallpox or scarlet fever. Few of us get malaria during the rainy season. Few of our mothers died in childbirth. Nobody in this room is malnourished. We're not like normal animals. We don't get sick the way normal animals do. We don't die the way they do. Basic normal mammalian death, you drink some contaminated water and you're dead from dehydration two days later. And what do we do? We spend 80 years having our bodies go to hell on us. So we do, oh great, I gotta listen to that for the next hour. This is actually <laughs> fabulous news because this is westernized disease. For the most part, we are not plagued by infectious diseases, diseases of poor nutrition, poor hygiene. Instead, we live well enough and long enough to slowly fall apart over time. And this is a magnificent advance in the human experience. Okay, just to give you a sense of it, like a little more than a century ago, 1900, what do you think were the leading causes of death in the United States? <laughs> Tuberculosis, good, what else? Childbirth. If you were a woman between ages 20 and 40, the single medically riskiest thing you could do in 1900 was attempt to give birth. What else was up there? Influenza, pneumonia, tuberculosis. Influenza, number one on the list. The flu. Nobody dies of the flu anymore. 1918, worst winter of World War I. People being blown out of trenches all over Europe. And if you were sent to the war that winter, your chances of surviving were better than if you got the flu. 8 million war deaths in World War I, 40 million dead civilians that winter from the flu. Nobody under age 100 dies of the flu anymore. Instead, we die of these totally bizarre diseases that never used to exist on this planet in any sort of frequency. Totally weird diseases like heart disease and cancer and diabetes and Alzheimer's and what you suddenly realize is this is a very novel realm we've entered in terms of making sense of which of us are sick and which are healthy. Okay, 20,000 years ago, you're some 20-year-old hunter-gatherer and you have screwed up big time. You have made a major medical mistake. You've just eaten some reed buck riddled with anthrax. And the medical outcome's absolutely clear. You've got like a three-day life expectancy. 
These days, as a 20-year-old, you make a major medical mistake. You decide a healthy diet consists of a lot of red meat and saturated fats and maybe a drink every other day or so, and it's not at all clear what the outcome's going to be. You may be dead in your grave at 50, or you may be running marathons with your grandkids when you're 85. And in lots of ways, the central question for westernized medicine is, so why do some of us last to 50 and some to 85? Some of it's got to do with like nuts and bolts biology, what your liver does with cholesterol or stuff like that. But some of it's got to do with questions nobody ever had to ask before in medicine. Totally bizarre questions like, what's your psychological makeup? Or what's your social status? Or how do people with your social status get treated in your society? Or how about this one? Get the answer to this question and you will have done more good for the health of humanity than anyone since like Jonas Salk inventing the polio vaccine. Why is it that when we feel like nobody loves us, we eat Oreo cookies? <laughs> answer that one and you have just solved half the cases of diabetes in this country. This is totally bizarre stuff. That has something to do with which of us are healthy or sick that has everything to do with it. And what we've entered is this very strange world when we look at the diseases that do us in, these diseases of slow accumulation of damage from lifestyle over time, these are predominantly diseases that can be caused by or be made worse by stress. And most of us in this room will have the profound westernized luxury of dropping dead someday of a stress-related disease. So nonetheless, amid that great news, it's a good thing if that happens later rather than sooner, so it's worth learning about this. Okay, we start off with definitions. I start off with a word I guarantee all of us had in ninth grade biology. With any luck, you have not thought about this word since then. Do you remember homeostasis? <laughs> homeostasis, having an ideal body temperature, having an ideal level of glucose in your bloodstream, having an ideal everything, being in homeostatic balance. A stressor is anything in the outside world that knocks you out of homeostatic balance. Your zebra, a lion has leapt out, ripped your stomach open, and your innards are dragging in the dust, and you still need to get out of there. This counts as being out of homeostatic balance. Or you're that lion, you're that lion who's half starved to death, and if you don't chase down that zebra successfully, you're not going to survive the night. Short-term physical crisis. And what you do at that point is you turn on the stress response. You secrete adrenaline and 11 other hormones I won't torture you with. What you do is you reestablish homeostatic balance. That's all you need to know about the subject if you're a zebra or a lion. If you're human, though, you've got to expand the definition in a critical way. Yes, a stressor can be when your body's been knocked out of homeostatic balance. In addition, a stressor can be when you think you're just about to be knocked out of homeostatic balance. If it turns out that you're right, that's great an anticipatory stress response. Woo, here comes the elephant. Maybe I'll increase my blood pressure now before it stomps me rather than after. That could be very adaptive. On the other hand, if you think you're just about to be knocked out of homeostatic balance and you really aren't about to be and you think that way all the time, there are medical ways of describing you. You're being neurotic as hell. You're being anxious. You're being paranoid. You're being hostile. Try to describe global warming to a hippo and it's going to have no idea what you're getting all upset about. But that's the critical point we do. The critical point of the whole thing is we turn on the exact same stress response as that zebra running for its life or a lion running for a meal, and we turn it on for purely psychological reasons. And that's the punchline of the entire field. That's not what it evolved for. For 99% of beasts on this planet, stress is three minutes of screaming terror, after which it's either over with or you're over with. And what do we do? We turn on the same stress response for 30-year mortgages. And that's not what it is for. And what we see here is this is why we and other really cognitively sophisticated primates are the ones who get mowed over by stress-related disease. This is a system that evolved for dealing with short-term physical crises, and we turn it on for chronic psychosocial stress.
Now, listening to this description, something should seem sort of questionable, though. I'm describing, okay, the stress response. You turn this on, if you're a zebra, you're injured, you're bleeding, you're hypotensive, or if you're the lion, you're starving, you're hypoglycemic. These are very different physical states. And one of the things they pound into your head in biology is your body comes up with a very specific solution for a very specific challenge. If you're hot, you don't shiver. Your body does something very differently than that. Yet here's the stress response, which does the exact same thing whether you're injured, starving, too hot, or too cold. Why should you turn on the same stress response in all these circumstances? And this was a question wrestled with by the guy who's officially sort of the godfather of stress and health. This was an Austrian physician in the 1930s named Hans Selye, who started the whole field because he was very smart and very intuitive and very insightful and very creative, and apparently he was totally lame at handling lab rats. And this is how he started the field. Selye was this young assistant professor at McGill University, Montreal, and he was looking for some research project, and some biochemist down the hall had isolated some hormone out of somebody's pancreas or something. Nobody knew what the stuff does. So Selye decides, that's it. I'm going to figure out the effects of this pancreatic stuff on the body. So what do you do? You go down the hall. You get a bucket load of the pancreatic stuff from your buddy. You come back, and you start injecting lab rats. And apparently, Selye simply was not very good at handling lab rats. So he's in there every day with the rats, injecting the rats and dropping the rats and chasing the rats, and the rats chasing him, and half the morning with a broom getting out from underneath the sink. Months of this goes by, and he discovers something amazing. All of the rats have stomach ulcers. <laughs> Selye is euphoric. He's just discovered the effects of this pancreatic crud on the body. It gives you a peptic ulcer. Now, fortunately, being a good scientist, Selye was also running a control group, rats that he's injecting every day with saline instead of the pancreatic stuff. So he's in there with the control rats, injecting them and dropping them, chasing them, them chasing him. He checks out the control rats, and they all have stomach ulcers. <laughs> okay. So your average scientist at this point gives up and goes to business school, but Selye thinks about this and he says, this is totally screwed, I'm seeing the exact same thing in the controls and the experimentals, it's got nothing to do with the pancreatic stuff. What do they have in common? Well, I'm pretty inept at handling these guys, they can't be having such a hot time here. Maybe what I'm seeing is some sort of non-specific response of the body to generalized unpleasantries. And Selye's insight was to, at that point, systematically expose rats to generalized unpleasantries. Put some of them up on the roof of the building in the winter, or down in the boiler rooms, or rooms with loud noise, or rooms filled with cat pee, or who knows what. And he always sees the same thing. They get stomach ulcers. We know exactly what Selye had just discovered. This was the tip of the iceberg of stress-related disease. And Selye was the guy who popularized what was this obscure term from metallurgy about torsional strain on metals, he's the one who said these animals are under stress and they turn on certain systems in their body that saves them from the stress, but if they turn it on for too long, you get sick. Everybody thought he was out of his mind because, again, you're trained. Your body solves specific challenges in very specific ways. And here's Selye with his imaginary stress response that gets turned on exactly the same if you're injured, starving, too hot, too cold, or on a blind date. Why should you turn on the same exact stress response in all these circumstances? And it turns out it makes a great deal of sense. Because whether you are that zebra or that lion, if you're going to survive the crisis, there's certain things you need to do with your body. First off, above all else, you need energy. Not energy tucked away in your fat cells for some building project next spring. Energy right now to hand to whichever muscles are going to save your neck. And with the onset of stress, you secrete adrenaline and a bunch of other hormones, and they go to the storage sites in your body, your liver, your fat cells. They mobilize energy out of storage form, dump it into the circulation. It's like you go to the bank and you empty out the savings accounts and turn it into cash circulating glucose, and you hand it over to whichever muscles are going to save you. Makes wonderful sense whether you're that zebra or that lion. The next thing you do makes perfect sense as well. You've just done all this amazing biochemistry and dumped all this energy in your bloodstream. You want to deliver it as fast as possible to your exercising muscles. Your heart speeds up. Your blood pressure increases, your breathing rate, you increase your cardiovascular tone, all is part of the strategy. Get that glucose, get that oxygen to your thigh muscles in two seconds instead of three, 
you're that much more likely to survive. Now, the next things you do during stress make perfect sense, which is you turn off all the long-term building projects. If there's a tornado due this afternoon, you don't spend the day outside gardening. You don't worry about long-term projects until you know there's a long-term. You shut down everything that is not critical. You shut down digestion. By definition, if you are that lion, you are not staggering up from some all-you-can-eat buffet, and if you are that zebra, the energy you're mobilizing for your muscles, you're mobilizing it from fat cells in just a couple of seconds. Digestion is slow. It takes forever. It costs a fortune. You're trying to avoid being somebody's lunch. Don't worry about digesting breakfast. And we all know the first step of that. Suppose you get stressed speaking in public. What happens? Your mouth gets dry. You've stopped secreting saliva, the first step of shutting down the whole gastrointestinal tract. With the onset of stress, you shut down growth, you shut down reproduction, big, expensive, optimistic things to be doing with your body, and this is no time for it. You know, you're running for your life, there's a lion two steps behind you, you know, ovulate some other time, (laughs) don't do it right now, hit puberty next week, grow antlers some other day, don't even think about sperm. With the onset of stress, you shut down growth, you shut down tissue repair, every sex hormone on earth disappears from the bloodstream, do it later if there is a later. Next, so you're that zebra and your innards are dragging in the dust. This might be a good time to perk up your immune system a little bit, just in case of some infective stuff. With the onset of stress, immune defenses are enhanced. Finally, a whole bunch of hormones secreted during stress get into your brain. And short term, their effects are fabulous. They sharpen memory. They increase glucose and oxygen delivery to your brain. Your sensory thresholds are sharper. You even release this neurotransmitter dopamine, which makes you feel good. Your memory is working. That's that flashbulb memory. Where were you when you heard the news? I'm willing to bet every single person in this room, no matter how long they live, you will all remember exactly where you were when you heard the news that Miley Cyrus was joining the Supreme Court. (laughs) Some stuff you just file away forever because it's important. Your brain needs to get a signal. This one, do not forget. So what you see here is everything going on here is exactly what you want to do if you're that zebra or that line. You're mobilizing energy. You're delivering where it's needed. You're shutting off unessentials. You're fighting infections. You're thinking more clearly. All you have to do to appreciate that is look at a couple of weirdo human diseases where people can't do this. One of them is called Shy Drager syndrome. Another one is Addison's disease. These are not diseases where, oh, you're now more at risk for certain cancers. This is like somebody with undiagnosed Addison's goes running for the commuter bus one morning and drops dead from hypoglycemic shock. So we've gotten our first critical take-home message here, which is if you plan to get stressed like a normal mammal, you had better turn on your stress response or else you got about a 30-second life expectancy. For most of us, though, the far more important take-home message revolves around, so what if you're turning on the stress response too often, too long, for purely psychological reasons? And what you get there, then, is disease at the other end of it. Now, Selye was the first person to wrestle with this issue. Why is it that chronic stress makes us sick? And he came up with an explanation in the 1930s, and it dominated the field for the next 40 years, which was too bad because he was totally wrong. Okay, here's what he thought was going on. Along comes a stressor, knocks you out of homeostatic balance, you turn on the stress response, you reestablish homeostasis, but the stressor goes on for too long. And thus you enter what Selye called the exhaustion phase. You run out of the stress response. Your adrenals run out of adrenaline. Your pituitary runs out of its stress hormones. It's like your military runs out of ammunition, and you're just left defenseless there with the stressor pummeling you. Turns out this was totally imaginary. There was no such thing as this exhaustion phase. No organism on Earth has ever been so stressed that it runs out of adrenaline. You don't deplete the stress response. The problem is that after a while, it's not that your military is running out of ammunition. After a while, 
while, you're spending so damn much on your military that you don't do health care or social services or <laughs> education or any of that stuff. And like, after a while, the stress response is more damaging than the stressor, especially if the stressor was some psychological nonsense. Everything you're doing here is penny-wise and dollar-foolish, it's inefficient, it's less than optimal. All of this is built around it's an emergency. It's an emergency. Fix later, grow later, don't do it right now. And if every day is an emergency, you pay the price for it. At the metabolic level, mobilize energy because the lion's running after you, no problem at all. Mobilize energy from your storage sites chronically because you're chronically psychologically stressed. And among other things, your muscle mass decreases. Muscle is one of your main energy storage sites. You get atrophy of muscle, myopathy. For extremely complex reasons, you're using your energy really inefficiently. For insanely complex reasons, you're now more at risk for adult onset insulin resistant diabetes. Now, adult onset diabetes is one of those interesting diseases that our great, 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 great grandparents never even dealt with. This is a disease of getting older in a typically westernized way, putting on weight, getting more sedentary, and everything down to the molecular level that goes wrong in your cells with adult onset diabetes, stress exacerbates the process. Same punchline at the cardiovascular level. If a lion is chasing you and your blood pressure is 180 over 120, you're not suffering from high blood pressure, you're saving your life. On the other hand, if your blood pressure is 180 over 120, every time you're stuck in traffic or something, you're not saving your life, you are suffering from stress-induced hypertension. And you do that chronically enough, and you're going to damage your cardiovascular system. Okay, 30 seconds on stress and heart disease. What's the scenario we all know about? Guy gets horrible news and he's wailing about something and he suddenly clutches his chest in pain, keels over dead, sudden cardiac arrest. This has never happened. This is like a movie plot. This never occurs in real life. Instead, what actually happens requires you to have like arcane knowledge of high school physics explaining why like toilet bowl plumbing wears out after a while. You got a tube and you got fluid moving through the tube and by definition, if the fluid is moving through with more force, elevated blood pressure, you begin to get fluid turbulence pounding away on the walls of your blood vessels, causing little bits of pitting and scarring and tearing, and then you get inflammation there, and then that's exactly where like glucose and cholesterol and fat wants to glom onto to clog your arteries. Where's the glucose and cholesterol and fat coming from? That's the stuff you're mobilizing into your circulation in the previous slide. So you get this synergistic double whammy here between the metabolic stress response and the cardiovascular setting you up for the number one killer in this country, cardiovascular disease. Now this link between stress and heart disease is so solid that it accounts for the most famous personality profile in all of medicine. And it's one where basically if you're coming out to a lecture on a perfectly nice evening to be outside taking a walk instead, I suspect it applies to like 80% of the people in this room, <laughs> which is those of us in here who have type A personality. Okay, type A personality. Type A was first described in the 1950s by a pair of cardiologists in San Francisco, Friedman and Rosenman. Here was their original formulation, time pressured, hostile, impatient, low self-esteem, joyless striving. Okay, like 90% of us. And what they observed back there in the 50s was, if this was your personality profile, you were more at risk for heart disease. Cardiologists hated these guys. You're some like Eisenhower cardiologist, and all you're thinking about is like blood lipids and heart valves, and here are these guys saying, no, you need to sit down your patient and talk to them. Christ, who wants to talk to their patients? And talk to them and say, okay, so suppose you're in the supermarket, and you pick the line that's moving slowly. Do you go berserk at that point? That's got something to do with heart disease? total resistance to the concept. And it wasn't until the 1980s that enough studies had been done that it became clear type A is for real big time. If you have type A personality, you are more at risk for cardiovascular disease than if you smoke, than if you are overweight, than if you have elevated cholesterol levels, a huge risk factor. 
Now, what became clear by the 80s was the critical component in the type A profile, the piece that is the one that contributes to the cardiovascular disease. And it's a term now that is used in the field if you have toxic hostility. Toxic hostility, this attributional style where everything that happens around you is proof that they're out to get you, they're out to get you more than everyone else, and the only thing to do is watch your back 24-7 and keep a knife ready. This is the style <coughs> where you're in the supermarket and you've picked the slow line and you want to kill the son of a bitch kid behind the cash register. Come on, come on, come on. How do you know I have a one o'clock meeting trying to screw me up? No, don't ask the old lady how she is today. Come on, come on, come on, come on. I'm going to die someday. I get to, you know, if this is what you're doing, instead of checking out the Elvis sightings in the National Enquirer, your <laughs> blood pressure is going to go up. And if this is what you're doing every time somebody could have held the elevator door open for you but didn't, if you're doing this 40 times a day, you're going to pound away at your blood vessels set up for cardiovascular disease. And these days, the main question in that field is, insofar as you are toxically hostile, what's worse for your heart? Expressing those toxic emotions or keeping them repressed inside? What's clear is expressing them is worse for everybody else's cardiovascular <laughs> health. But what is the cost of repressing strong physiological emotions? So that's an area of a lot of ongoing research. Okay, so that's stress and heart disease. Actually, how did those guys first figure out about type A personality, given how much that was coming out of left field? And I actually got to hear this story some years ago out of the horse's mouth himself. Meyer Friedman, the cardiologist who first described type A, died a few years ago in his early 90s, saw his last patient a week before he died, was working full time at a cardiology unit, UCSF Medical Center. As he used to say, I'm still type A, but I'm a type A tortoise now. Um, and here's the story he would tell. <clears throat> In the 50s, he and his partner had this cardiology practice, everything was going great, except for this one weird thing, which is they were spending a fortune having to reupholster the armchairs in the waiting room. What's this about? Who knows? Whatever. It's part of the overhead. Every month this upholsterer comes and there's a chair or two that needs to be fixed. One month the upholsterer is out on vacation. Replacement upholsterer comes in, takes one look at the chairs, and discovers type A personality. He says, what is wrong with your patients? Nobody wears out chairs this way. And they have one of them left. And as you can see here, the front two inches of the armrests and the seat cushions are totally shredded and the rest of the chair is perfectly fine. It's like every night there's like dwarf beavers in there clawing away their chair. What is this? This is the type A profile. This is somebody with type A personality. This is what they do to a chair when they're waiting in the waiting room with their cardiologist to hear if there's bad news or not. This is not just figuratively but literally sitting on the edge of your seat and squirming and clawing and all of that. This is what somebody who's type A does to a chair in that circumstance. Okay, so what happens at that point if science is working right and you know, Friedman should grab him and like, good God, man, what you've discovered or like, like midnight conferences between upholsterers and cardiologists or, or, or teams of idealistic young upholsterers sweeping across America and coming back with the news that no, you don't find chairs like these in podiatrists' offices. That's what should have happened. What happens instead, here's where 90-year-old Dr. Friedman starts looking all sheepish. He says, <coughs> he says, I told my nurse, get this man out of here. I'm this important cardiologist. I can't waste my time with him. Give him this damn check. Get him out of my face. He was too type A to listen to the guy. And it wasn't <coughs> until about five years later that he collaborated with these psychologists and back came the type A profile. And they said, oh my god, the upholsterer, he was right. To this day, they have no idea who that guy was. <laughs> Now let's see, it is late afternoon in San Francisco. I'm willing to bet there's some bar in San Francisco right now where there's like this 110-year-old retired upholsterer and get this guy going and he's going to go on and on about how he discovered type A personality, exactly what occurred. So one of the dark chapters in my profession. Okay, moving on, digestion. Shut down your digestive system for two minutes running for your life. It's not a big deal. Shut it down chronically, and there's all sorts of gastrointestinal disorders you're more at risk for. Most famously, 
ulcers. Back to Cellier in the 1930s, the first stress-related disease. Stress causes ulcers, stress causes ulcers, canonical knowledge. Everybody knows this. And then about 25 years ago, there's this revolution in ulcerology. Turns out there's a bacteria called Helicobacter pylorus. Turns out the bacteria is responsible for about 90% of ulcers in the West. It gets into your stomach, it generates oxygen radicals and blows holes in the walls of your stomach. It's a bacterial disorder. This was an enormous contribution. The two guys who discovered it gets the Nobel Prize. Amazing. The evening this is announced, every gastroenterologist on Earth goes out that evening and celebrates. This is the greatest news they've ever heard because they're not going to have to sit down their page and make eye contact and say, do you have any stress? It's got nothing to do with stress. Here's some antibiotics. Get out of my office. It's got nothing to do with stress. It's got everything to do with stress. Because only 10% of people with the bacteria get the ulcer. You've got to have the bacterial risk factor, but you've got to have a lifestyle risk factor overlapping as well. Stress. Stress does not cause ulcers. The bacteria does. What does stress do when you got an ulcer beginning to start? Your stomach's reasonably good at repairing it and rebuilding the wall there before the ulcer gets troublesome unless you're chronically stressed. And every day your stomach walls are saying, ah, do it tomorrow, do it tomorrow. It feels like we're being chased by a predator. Psychological stress shuts down the reparations there. So here we have a classic example of interactions between the organic causes of disease and the psychogenic. Stress is still very relevant to making sense of ulcers. Next, growth. Shut down growth for three minutes while you're running for your life, not a big deal. Our theme by now, shut it down chronically. This can be problematic, especially if you were a kid. All kids are, are big long-term building projects. And if for reasons of psychological stress, you keep saying, do it tomorrow, do it tomorrow, you can impair growth. And at an extreme, you have one of the truly bizarre outposts of medicine, a disease of kids who stop growing for reasons purely of psychological stress known as psychogenic dwarfism, psychosocial dwarfism, stress dwarfism. These are kids who are years behind the normal growth rates and there's no disease. They're not malnourished. There's no parasites. You check their bloodstream. There's like no growth hormone. You give them synthetic growth hormone. Nothing happens. The whole system is shut down. And at that point, you start poking around in their background and often out comes some appalling psychological stressor. And the amazing thing is, get them out of that stressful setting, technical term, do a parentectomy on them, and growth will resume at that point. This is incredibly well understood how this works. Open up any textbook of endocrinology, go to the chapter on growth, and I guarantee there will be the obligatory picture of the stress dwarfism kid. You know those pictures of stunted cues, like naked in front of the growth chart with a rectangle over the eyes, and turn the page, and I guarantee there's the obligatory follow-up picture. The kid in a different environment two years later, he's like six foot 14, he's playing for the NBA. It's everything, you know, there's still the rectangle in nakedness, but everything else gets better. And what you see there is, this is the system with an amazing capacity to recover. Remarkable cases of this. For example, this was a case report a few years ago. This was a child brought in from an extremely abusive psychological setting into New York Hospital with stress dwarfism, and as documented in the paper, at the time he came into this pediatric unit, zero growth hormone in his bloodstream. Over the next few months, he became very close with one nurse there, and this was like the first normal emotional relationship of his life. After a couple of months, normal growth hormone levels for his age. At that point, the nurse goes on vacation. By the end of her two-week vacation, he's back down to zero. Nurse comes back. A week later, he's back up to there. Think about this. The rate at which this child was depositing calcium in his bones could be entirely predicted by how safe and loved he was feeling in the world. You can't ask for a much better example of what's going on here affects every outpost in the body. 
Now, the issue with stress dwarfism amid people understanding exactly which hormones are doing what, the issue, of course, becomes how common is this disease? If you were shorter than average and you were not obviously malnourished as a kid, are you a victim of stress dwarfism? Did your parents do that to you? No, this is not like, oh, very stressful childhood. We were moving all the time. This is not like acrimonious divorce. This is nightmare psychopathology. This is the police and the social workers breaking down the door of an apartment and finding the kid chained to the radiator and smeared in excrement and just nightmare stuff and get the kid out of that setting and there's recovery, the clinical consensus is this is a once in a career disease that you see extremely rare. Except it's not so rare. It pops up all over the place. Kids in war zones, kids in areas of civil strife. A research assistant of mine and I think we've got the data to show that kids who wound up in the Japanese American internment camps in World War II had mild stress dwarfism. It pops up all over the place. One classic study <coughs> in the 60s, looking at rites of passages from cultures all over the planet. Rites of passages, in one culture they take you out of the desert and stake you down and cover you in poison ants, and some other culture you play the piano for your grandmother and her friends, or whatever's done in your tribe. They did like 80 tribal comparisons, they controlled for genetics. Back comes the finding, stressful rites of passages during the first few years of life, two inches shorter as an adult. Big effect. Let me tell you about the single creepiest example of stress dwarfism I've ever heard of. If for some inexcusable reason you ever find yourself reading chapter after chapter about growth hormone, you're going to notice there's a weird thing, which is a lot of the chapters make reference to Peter Pan. Some quote from Peter Pan or some snide comment about Tinkerbell. I'd seen this for years. I had no idea what this was about until one day I stumbled on an explanation. And this was a chapter about the psychological regulation of growth, and it was talking about stress dwarfism, gave the following case history. Eight-year-old boy, growing up in Victorian England in the 1870s, one day he sees his beloved older brother killed in front of him in an accident. This destroys the family. There were no other siblings. The father was like emotionally non-existent. This was the mother's favorite child. And in this Victorian swoon, she takes to her bed with the shades drawn for the next 10 years. This kid growing up in this horrible emotional isolation, he goes into the bedroom with a tray of food for his mother, and she's saying, oh, David, David, is that you, David? Have you come to me? Have you David, the dead son? David, are you finally here? Oh, it's only you. Growing up being only you. Apparently, the only thing she ever spoke to him about was this idea she grabbed onto, which was, if David had to die, he'll always be my perfect little boy who never grew up and became a man and didn't need his mother anymore. He'll always be my perfect little boy because he didn't grow up, didn't grow up, didn't grow up. This kid hears this with a vengeance. Middle-class family, no evidence of disease or malnutrition. Boy stops growing there at age eight, lives to age 60, four foot ten as an adult, unconsummated marriage. Incredible example of stress dwarfism. And then, then the chapter concludes by informing us that as an adult, this was the author of the much beloved children's classic, Peter Pan. This was J.M. Barry, the guy who wrote Peter Pan, who's incredibly screwed up. This guy, all he did was crank out book after play after novella about boys who die and come back as ghosts and marry their mothers. His private journals were full of sadomasochistic fantasies about little boys. This guy spent the rest of his life dealing very unsuccessfully with his stress dwarfism. So think about that the next time you see Johnny Depp up on a movie. Okay. <laughs> Next, next, reproduction. Your gonads, your gonads, your gonads are not going to be working very well if you were chronically stressed. If you were a female mammal of virtually any species, if you were chronically stressed, your cycles will become irregular, lengthened, they may stop altogether. Stress-induced amenorrhea, stress-induced anovulation, and people understand exactly how those work. Which hormones are working at the brain, at the pituitary, at the ovaries, at the uterus to shut things down. Let me tell you about one of those steps, because it's got to do with a very weird thing that female mammals do, including human females, which is they secrete a certain amount of male sex hormones into the bloodstream. Hormones that are related to testosterone, androgen type hormones. They come out of the adrenal glands, not a ton of the stuff, maybe 5% the levels you would see in the male. Nonetheless, you got to get rid of it. 
And fortunately, female mammals come with this enzyme in fat cells that takes circulating androgens and does biochemistry 101 and converts them to estrogens. Great, perfect, problem solved. Everyone lives happily ever after. What if you're stressed? What if you're stressed like the locusts have come and eaten your crops and you're subsisting on 800 calories a day? What if you're slowly starving? Your fat stores are slowly getting depleted. And at some point, you have too little functional fat cells to do the androgen to estrogen conversion. One problem is there's now a little bit less estrogen in the bloodstream. Bigger problem is the androgen levels build up there and that shuts down every step in the system. That's why starvation shuts down ovulation. That's why voluntary starvation, anorexia, does the same. And that's why some women who do massive, massive amounts of exercise will stop ovulating as well because you get below a critical fat-muscle ratio there. Now, this is something that's been studied at length. In girls, for example, it's always studies of very serious ballet dancers or gymnasts. What you see is significant delay in the onset of puberty. One study, for example, this was done on the Olympic gymnastic squad from Romania. You know, those 60-pound, 15-year-olds getting the gold medals all over the place. What was the average age at which these kids started menstruating? 19. 12 and a half is the Western average. Once hitting puberty, women who do tons of athletics, as best studied long distance runners, women who run an average of 40 to 50 miles a week, that's typically the range where fat stores are getting below threshold, where you begin to have ovulatory irregularities. I can tell you the exact same story about men. Men who run 40, 50 miles a week, sperm count goes down, there's mild testicular atrophy. Okay, wait a second, I thought exercise was good for us. <laughs> exercise is good for us, and in fact, a lot of exercise is very good for us. That doesn't mean, though, that an insane amount of exercise is insanely good for us. It means at some point, too much of a good thing is just as bad as too little. You've passed a point of homeostatic balance. And all you need to do to get an appreciation for that is imagine you sit down some hundred hunter-gatherer from the Kalahari Desert and say, you know, where I come from, we have so much food and so much free time that sometimes we'll just go run 26 miles in a day for the sheer pleasure. <laughs> and they're going to say, are you crazy? That's stressful. I mean, throughout hominid history, if you're running 26 miles in a day, either you are very intent on eating somebody or somebody's intent on eating you. This is not normal physiology. So we get a cautionary note here. Meanwhile, over at the male end of things, with the onset of stress, down go testosterone levels. Anesthetize a guy, slice into his belly for surgery, 10 minutes later, testosterone is plummeting. First year male medical students during exam periods, down go testosterone. Drop the rank of a male baboon in a hierarchy, down goes testosterone. Here's a stressor which, thank God, I have no personal experience with at all. But apparently, it's not fun to be in the Marines. Apparently, it's kind of a drag, especially during basic training. This was this classic study, 1970, New England Journal of Medicine, looking at military recruits during basic training, where now, on top of everything else, they had to pee into little Dixie cups for the psychiatrist, and back comes the finding. Guys in the, in the Marines during their first couple of months of service, they have the circulating androgen levels of, like, Vatican choir boys. That's how much the system is shut down. Okay. So people understand exactly which stress hormones are working at the brain, the pituitary, and the testes to shut down testosterone synthesis during stress. The question you got to ask at this point is, so what are the consequences of testosterone levels declining during stress? And amazingly enough, the answer is there's no consequences at all. Testosterone turns out to be this vastly overrated hormone. Like basically, all you need is like a thimble full of stuff and a couple of sperm and you're in business. You gotta knock out like 90% of a guy's testosterone levels to seriously impair fertility. Stress, what does it do? It's its worst, only about a 60% decline. It's not suppressed enough that it makes a difference. The problem during stress is not that testosterone levels go down. The problem is that penises go down. <laughs> okay, am I allowed to talk about this in Champaign-Urbana here? Okay, finally, we come to the first like useful point in this damn lecture. So how do erections work? Okay, so erections. In order to, I just saw somebody there pick up a pen for the first time this whole lecture. <laughs> 
Okay, so how do erections work? In order to have an erection, you gotta have a spinal cord. Now most of what your spinal cord does is totally boring and make you shake hands and sign checks and foxtrot or who knows what, but then there's the part that does the good stuff. The stuff you normally don't have any control over, stuff that is automatic, like goose flesh and orgasms and pupillary contractions and blushing, things that are automatic and thus run by the automatic nervous system, also known as the autonomic nervous system. Now the autonomic nervous system comes in two halves. First half, sympathetic nervous system. Emergency, arousal, adrenaline, stress response, all hell breaking loose. Second half, the parasympathetic nervous system. Calm vegetative function. You take a nap, you turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. You eat a big starchy meal, you turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. You get disemboweled by a lion, you turn off the parasympathetic nervous system. It works in opposition with the sympathetic. Okay, so here's the rule. In order to get an erection, you've got to turn on the parasympathetic nervous system. You have to be calm and vegetative. Okay, so you got your erection now, what happens next? Maybe for some social reason having to do with the context that brought about the erection, maybe you start feeling a little bit less calm and vegetative. Maybe your heart rate increases a little. Maybe your breathing rate, maybe your muscles are starting to do some work. Slowly you're starting to turn on the sympathetic nervous system. More time goes by. Your heart is racing, your toes are curling, you're sweating, you're breathing fast, all of that. Eventually you get to this point where your whole body is screamingly sympathetic, except for this one lone outpost we are desperately holding on to parasympathetic tone as long as possible. Finally, can't take any more. You turn off the parasympathetic, you turn on the sympathetic, and you ejaculate. <laughs> okay, so that's how erections work. <laughs> so, what happens during stress? What happens during stress? You're not very calm and vegetative. You can't get the erection, stress-induced impotency. Or you can have a second problem. Suppose you manage to get the erection, and you think like, Oh no, Donald Trump, who knows why? You accelerate, you accelerate the transition. You accelerate the transition from parasympathetic to sympathetic, the whole thing goes too fast. Either you can't get the erection or premature ejaculation. Incredibly easy for this to occur. Current estimates are 60% of the visits by men in this country going to doctors about erectile dysfunction turn out not to have an organic disease basis, but instead are psychogenic, stress-related. Okay, second useful piece of information. So how do you tell the difference between a case of organic impotency and psychogenic? So a guy comes to you, says he hasn't been able to have an erection during sex in the last six months, and you're wondering, well, is this stress related, or does he have a pituitary tumor, or whatever? You take advantage of a weird thing that male primates, including human males do, which is when they go into REM sleep, rapid eye movement sleep, they get erections. I have no idea why. I've talked to Earth's penis experts. Nobody has an explanation for this. Nonetheless, male primates get REM sleep erections. So here's what you do. The guy who hasn't been able to have an erection during six sex in months, what you do is you give him this handy-dandy little penile pressure cuff transducer thingy that he takes home, and just before he goes to sleep, he puts it on the base of his penis and wires it up and satellite relays and 24-hour operators in Bangalore, and the next day, the next day you got your answer, which is, if this guy hasn't been able to have an erection during sex in the last six months, but 30 seconds into his first REM stage, he has a perfectly normal erection, he doesn't have a pituitary tumor, it's stress-related. That's how you distinguish between the two. Do you still get the nocturnal erections? If that's the case, it's stress-related. Very easy to, actually, maybe this is not so easy, because you got this electronic device, and it's beeping thing and the wires and you're so sure it's going to electrocute you, that's a stressor in and of itself. This is what is done in the majority of sexual dysfunction clinics in this country. I kid you not, you take a long string of postage stamps, you lick them at one end, and you wrap them around the guy's penis. And the next morning, if the stamps have been torn loose, the guy had an erection during the night. Can you believe like how elegant this is? Like five bucks, you get a lab result. It's fabulous. Yeah. Oh, of course, insurance won't reimburse you for the stamps, but still, you know, maybe Obamacare still has a chance. Okay, so what we see here is another outpost of vulnerability, and perhaps we should hurtle on before I embarrass myself further. Your immune system, your immune system. So as we heard before, with the onset of stress, you enhance your immune defenses. 
With chronic stress, something very different occurs. With chronic stress, not only does the immune system go back to baseline, you suppress immunity. With chronic stress, you become immune suppressed. And this is the starting point for just this irresistible syllogism insofar as chronic stress chronically suppresses the immune system, chronic stress should set you up for more infectious diseases. And this is the basic premise behind this field that emerged about 25 years ago, psychoneuroimmunology, the notion that what's going on here is affecting your immune defenses. And a quarter century into this field, it's clear that's exactly how it works for all the boring stuff. When you are under stress, the common cold becomes more common. You are at more risk for mononucleosis, for herpes viral flare-ups, reactivation. What's far less clear is what about bigger realms of infectious disease? How about if you have AIDS? Your immune system declining. If you are severely stressed, does it decline even faster? Jury is out on that one. It seems to have to do with personality type as an intervening variable. How about the biggest one on everybody's list when it comes to worrying about disease? So what's the relationship between stress and cancer? And everybody knows the answer to that, which is cancer is a stress-related disease. Stress can cause you to have cancer. Stress can cause you to come out of remission from cancer. Stress can accelerate the growth of tumors. Everybody knows about this sufficiently so that some years ago there was a study in JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, looking at women who had just gotten a metastatic breast cancer diagnosis where they were asked, so what do you think is the cause of your cancer? And by more than a two to one margin, the most common answer was stress too much stress in my life. Stress has virtually nothing to do with cancer. There has never been a decent prospective human study longitudinally that shows that stress increases the risk, reoccurrence, or growth rate of any type of tumor. When they're well controlled, there have been all sorts of studies showing how stress can accelerate tumor growth in lab rats. We know how it works. My lab did some of that work. But it turns out these are types of cancers that are completely irrelevant to human cancer. This is a realm where there's not much connection at all. Amid all those things on the right sides of these charts, you need to worry about this is one domain where you don't. Why is it important to emphasize this? Because of all of these highly credentialed quacks who are making a fortune off of cancer patients saying, my special brand of stress therapy will slow down your cancer, stop it, reverse it, credit cards accepted. There's no science to support this. Bad medicine, bad science, bad ethics. This is a domain where you don't have to worry. Okay, so quickly let's hurdle back to domains where you do have to worry. Okay, so back to stress in your brain. We saw short term does all sorts of great stuff. Chronically, bad news. Chronically, stress will damage a part of your brain called the hippocampus, which is essential for learning and memory. Stress has something to do with failure of memory consolidation there, shrinkage of neurons, disconnecting of synapses, at an extreme killing of neurons, inhibition of the birth of new neurons there. And this is turning out to be relevant to humans in a number of scary realms. People with chronic stress due to PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, combat trauma or sexual abuse trauma, and what you see there is atrophy of the hippocampus, only the hippocampus, the more severe the trauma history, the more atrophy, the more memory problems, best evidence is this is not reversible. Second syndrome, pertinent to the 10 to 15 percent of us in this room destined to have major clinical depression, the poster child in psychiatry of a stress-related disorder. It involves chronically elevated stress hormone levels and scads of studies now showing atrophy of the hippocampus, only the hippocampus. The more severe the depression history, the more atrophy, the more memory loss. And as far as most studies show at this point, this is not a reversible process. Meanwhile, next door to the hippocampus is a brain region called the amygdala. And in the amygdala, things are real different. Hippocampus does learning and memory for you. Amygdala teaches you to be afraid. It does fear. It does anxiety. And while stress is atrophying away those hippocampal neurons, stress is making neurons in the amygdala work better than usual. 
They expand their connections. The synapses become more excitable. People with PTSD have amygdalas that grow larger than normal. Stress makes it easier for you to associate things with fear that are not actually valid and makes you harder to detect, to, to detect safety signals. This is the link between stress and anxiety. Meanwhile, over in that part of the brain where you're releasing dopamine, which has something to do with pleasure, with the onset of stress, chronic stress, and you're depleted of dopamine. What is this setting us up for explaining the link between stress and depression? The defining symptom of depression is anhedonia. Hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure, anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure, this is the neurochemical link why chronic stress is a major precipitating factor for depression. So, okay, if you're still awake at this point, you should be depressed as hell. Okay. <laughs> So amid that, it must seem like a miracle that any of us are still alive. Actually, let me make this worse. One last stress-related disease. This is like stress for 2000. How many of you have heard of a disease called idiopathic alopecia areata? Okay, a few heads. This is the profoundly rare state of somebody being so, so traumatized by something that over the next few days, their hair turns white and falls out. This is for real. People understand like what the immune system is doing to the hair follicles there. It's for real. It's a once in a career disease, but nonetheless, this is for real. Look at this. You're chronically stressed. You get high blood pressure. You get diabetes. You get flatulent. Your sex life is ruined. Your brain gets damaged and your hair falls out. How is it any of us are still functioning here? Why haven't we all collapsed into puddles of stress-related disease? And the critical thing is most of us don't. Most of us cope. And what's been clear from the first day of the field with Cellier is some individuals cope with stress better than others. I, what I want to spend the last couple of minutes on is how we understand this to work. Why do some bodies, and more importantly, some psyches deal better with stress than others? Okay, so if we're talking about individual differences in stress responsiveness here, we're not talking about physical stressors. Finish this lecture, go outside, unexpectedly be gored by an elephant, and you could have a stress response. There's no way you can't reframe your experience and grow from adversity or who knows what. You could have a stress response. Finish the lecture, go outside, and have kind of a tense, ambiguous interaction with someone, and only some of us will have a stress response. What is it about that gray zone of psychosocial interactions that is more stressful for some individuals than others? What we're asking here is, what is it that makes psychological stress stressful? And remarkably, a mass of literature stretching back decades shows what precisely are the building blocks of psychological stress. Okay, here's a schematic summary of a gazillion studies, what they would sort of show. Take a lab rat, put him in the cage, every now and then he gets a shock, mild shock, and nonetheless, with enough of them, this is stressful. Blood pressure goes up, heart rate goes up, risk of ulcer goes up, as shown here. You're giving the rat a stress-related disease. Now, second line, in a second cage, there's another rat. Psychology jargon, the second rat is yoked to the first rat. Every time the first rat gets a shock, so does the second. Same intensity, same duration, same everything. According to Cellier in 1930, both of their bodies are being knocked out of homeostatic balance, the exact same extent, except for a critical difference, which is every time that second rat gets a shock, it can go over to the other side of the cage where there's another rat, and it can bite the crap out of it. And you know what? That rat's not going to get an ulcer. The guy he's biting is going to get one, but this one doesn't. He has an outlet for his frustration. Third line. Now we have in the second cage a second rat getting the same shock, same duration, same intensity, same everything, but each time he gets a shock, he can go over and there's a bar of wood that he could gnaw on with his teeth. And he doesn't get an ulcer. He has a hobby. Okay, <laughs> now, in the next line, what we have here is same shock, same intensity, same everything, but 10 seconds before each shock, the second rat, a little warning light comes on and the rat doesn't get an ulcer. For the same external stressor, we are more protected when we get 
predictive information. When is it coming? How bad is it going to be? How long is it going to last? And we all know that principle every time we ask the dentist how much more drilling. And we all know the difference between the dentist that says two more bits and we're done and the one that says, yeah, it could be, it could be weeks you're going to be here. <laughs> and when the dentist says two more bits of drilling, bad news, you're not done yet. Good news, the second that second bit of drilling is over with, you're safe. For the rat in the first line, any second, you can be a half second away from the next shock. Next line. This is a rat that's been trained to press a lever. By pressing the lever, it decreases the likelihood of getting a shock. Today, the rat is yoked to the first one, getting the same shocks as the first guy, but there's a lever in there. The lever's disconnected. The lever has done nothing whatsoever, but the rat doesn't know it. So he's in there pounding away the lever, saying, this is great. Just imagine how many shocks you can be getting. Otherwise, he thinks he has control. For the same external stressor, a sense of control makes things less stressful. Jumping ahead to the final line, shock a rat, and now it goes over to the other side of the cage where there's a rat that it knows and likes and they groom each other and it doesn't have a stress response. Wow, science has finally proven that friends are good for your health. Science has proven this big time. When you look at all of behavioral medicine and all of health psychology, there are two of the biggest predictors out there as to mortality rates across all diseases. The first one taps into every one of the factors on the slide, which is never, ever make the mistake of being born into a poor family because your health is going to pay for it the rest of your life. The link between health and socioeconomic status, very heavily mediated by stress. The second biggest predictor is, if you've got a choice in the matter, don't be socially isolated. When you look at the extremes of social isolation versus social affiliation, significant other, others, small group of friends, community group you're intensely involved with, for the same disease impact, almost a threefold difference in mortality rate. And that's after you control for stuff like, ooh, people who live alone just eat Cheetos for dinner and nobody to remind them to take their meds. Control for that and social isolation is an aching stressor for every primate out there, including us, and a huge health risk factor. So what is it that makes psychological stress stressful? For the same external misery, you are more likely to feel subjectively stressed, more likely to turn on a stress response, and more at risk for stress-related disease if you feel like you have no control, no predictability, no outlets for the frustration, if you interpret things as getting worse, and you have nobody's shoulder to cry on. And basically, this is the place to stop. Because again, none of us are getting ulcers because we're being chased by saber-toothed tigers. None of us are ever going to have to wrestle people for canned food items and bombed out supermarkets. Instead, we are going to have this luxury of living well enough and long enough amid our psychological stressors to pay the medical cost. And that's the critical point at the end. To the extent that we are smart enough to have invented these psychosocial stressors and then stupid enough to have fallen for them, we all have the potential to instead be wise enough to keep them in perspective. So on that note, thank you for your attention and good luck with your stressors. Yeah. <laughs>